Apostle Peter wrote to encourage the weary and the hurting, those who had been scattered because of persecution and tribulation. Peter called the church to stand upon the promises of God and remain faithful to the end. How do we live in faith in the midst of trials? As we are now ready for the Word of God, would you join me in a moment of prayer? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this opportunity to open up your holy Word and hear a word from you. Father, we pray that through the pages of Scripture, through this passage of Scripture, that we would hear you speaking to us, that this moment in your Word would build up your church. Father, I pray as, as the one preaching that I would be faithful to your word and your word alone. That this would be your time to speak to your people. May I not get in the way. Father, we pray these things. So thankful that your spirit leads us to truth. So thankful that this is an opportunity to be shaped into the image of your son. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Charles Sheldon faithfully pastored the Central Congregational Church in Topeka, Kansas for for many years when he grew saddened by the dip in attendance of the Sunday evening prayer meeting. He was so saddened by this that he, he spent time in prayer. He, he began to think, and he came up with a plan to shake things up rather than the brief devotional and time of prayer Charles Sheldon began to preach sermons in story form. And each Sunday evening, the sermon had a hook, a cliffhanger that would leave the congregation coming back the next week with invited friends. Soon, the church was overwhelmed by the size of the crowds. Those sermons were published in book form in 1896 under the title, In His Steps. Estimated that the book has sold over 50 million copies, and it's counted as one of the best-selling books of any genre of all time. The book form begins with a story of a Friday when a jobless man, a man out of work, knocks on the door of Reverend Henry Maxwell. This jobless man knocks on the door right as the pastor is finishing his sermon for Sunday. He, he briefly listens to the helpless man's plea, but then shushes him away and closes the door. He doesn't think about the man again until that Sunday when Reverend Maxwell is near the conclusion of his sermon, and that jobless man comes walking in the back door. And he walks in the back door, he comes all the way to the front, he turns around and he faces the congregation. Politely, but, but frankly, this man without a job speaks to the congregation about their lack of compassion for those in need in the city. And that beginning of the book <laughs> ends with this this jobless man collapsing 
front of the congregation, and a few days later, he dies. The next Sunday, Reverend Maxwell, disturbed by what has taken place over the course of the last week, stands before his congregation once again and exhorts them, don't do anything. Don't, don't do anything at all before you ask yourself one question. And he presented to his congregation the question, what would Jesus do? That foundational question to in his steps, that foundational question to those sermons came back into popularity in the 1990s with these little bracelets with the, with the WWJD on them, attempting to get us to ask the question, what would Jesus do? Yet the call to follow in Jesus' steps didn't originate with WWJD bracelets, didn't even originate with Sheldon Sermons or his 1896 novel. To call, the call, to follow in the steps of Jesus began in our New Testament. And we see one of those instances in our passage from 1 Peter chapter 2 this morning. I invite you to join me there. 1 Peter chapter 2. We're picking up right where we left off last week at verse 11. And we'll read through the end of the chapter. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. For the handful in the worship center, if you've got 1 Peter open, can I hear a big, loud amen? Amen. Amen. For those at home, uh, once again, I encourage you, if you're watching through an avenue that allows you to comment, uh, please do so. Please engage with the sermon, not only through amens, but please underscore, underline things that stand out to you. 1 Peter chapter 2 beginning in verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governor who was sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves. In reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your master, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. 
He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When, when he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep gone astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Amen. As is the case every week, and particularly in the book of First Peter, there's so much that could be said and that I want to say, but in our time this morning, I just have a few brief words for you. And the first is this. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. If you look back at our passage in verse 11, the apostle Peter refers to the church as foreigners and exiles depending on your translation, or if you look at various translations, uh, we look at it and we see foreigners and exiles, but others may have pilgrims or aliens or strangers. Peter is expressing this idea, this truth, that as followers of Jesus Christ, our citizenship is in heaven. Apostle Peter is stressing the truth that as followers of Jesus Christ, this world is not our home. As the hymn writer said, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are, held, are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Peter's original audience, and we have to keep reminding of ourselves of this as we read 1 Peter. Peter's original audience was scattered throughout the region due to persecution. They were uprooted and scattered because of their faith in the resurrected Jesus Christ. They were viewed and treated as outsiders. So here the Apostle Peter gives them the name of foreigners and, and exiles. He, he acknowledges the earthly and spiritual reality that they are living as foreigners and exiles. When you first hear that, you first read that, it might sound harsh. But, but upon deeper reflection, upon deeper meditation, imagine this group that has placed their life at the foot of the cross they have trusted in the resurrected Savior. And because of their faith, they are being persecuted and treated with hostility. Apostle Peter says, foreigners and exiles here, this world is not your home. You, you are citizens of heaven. At first, it may sound harsh, but I think upon deeper reflection and meditation, it provides a great deal of comfort. And the spiritual reality that was true for Peter's first audience is true for you this morning. If you were one who has placed your faith in the resurrected Jesus, your citizenship is in heaven, and this world 
is not your home. After making that point very early on in this passage, the the Apostle Peter then goes on to speak about how this impacts our lives. That brings me to my second word to you this morning. As citizens of heaven, we point the world to our heavenly Father. As citizens of heaven, we point the world to our heavenly Father. I'll draw your attention uh, to verse 12 from our passage this morning. It's a a crucial verse for understanding, for for reading the entirety of 1 Peter. Verse 12 summarizes everything that we've already discussed, and it gives weight to everything that we will discuss. The Apostle Peter instructs the church to to live good lives among the pagans so that the world will see good deeds and glorify God. As citizens of heaven, we should point the world to our heavenly Father As citizens of heaven, as followers of Jesus Christ, we should should stand out and not fit in. We should look more like heaven and less of the world. We should stand out and not fit in, but... Peter gives us some guidelines for that, and he he shows us that it's not as easy as we might think. And he shows us that we actually stand out in a way that is different than we might think. We stand out with intention. Before we get to the details, we, we have to admit that we have trouble doing this. We can lean towards being rude and judgmental rather than kind and Christ-like. We can lean towards being a closed group rather than a welcoming community. We can lean towards being loud and obnoxious rather than patient and prayerful. So, Peter gives his original audience very specific guidelines. He gives them pointed points of application from verse 13 through 20. He gives them guidelines for living good lives among the pagans. And and, and we'll run through these. But before we do, you've got to remember that he's speaking to a group that was being persecuted for their faith. They were being treated with hostility. And it's to that group that he exhorts the church to submit themselves to civil authority. He says, if you're going to get punished, get punished for doing good. Don't get punished for for breaking the rules. Don't get punished for for evil things. Get punished for doing good. If you're going to get punished, get punished for doing good because that will silence ignorant and foolish people. He exhorts them to to live as free people, but, but don't let your freedom cover up your evil behavior. He goes on to exhort them to to live with respect and regard to everyone. That means loving the family of believers. It means fearing God. And it even means respecting civil authority. 
He then goes into another pointed example, and he exhorts slaves to submit to their masters. Now, we don't have time to spend a great deal of time here, but first of all, we need to be reminded that this is not slavery like early American history. Second of all, this is not an endorsement of slavery. We can read the Scripture and see that the Bible clearly states that slavery is terrible and it's it's abomination but here he's addressing the fact that slavery was commonplace like work and taxes and he's Peter's taking this broken system a common system of the day and he's trying to infuse it with Christ like behavior all of these examples from 13 to 20 Show us, see, Peter asking the question, in any of these scenarios, in any of these situations, what would Jesus do? And then he instructs the church to follow in the steps of Jesus. What makes this really hard is when you go through those examples, those guidelines for living good lives among the pagans, the response is never one made out of personal gain. Every response, every application is one asking the question, what would Jesus do? And Peter provides the application that would lead people to glorify God. Now the question becomes, if this letter was written for the church of 2020, what would the guidelines be? We get first century points of application, but if this was a letter written to the church of right here and now, what would the guidelines be? I think there would have to be a reference to social media. Before you make that post, Perhaps the question that should enter your mind, perhaps that what should enter your mind is, what would Jesus do? What, what would Jesus post? Or, or what would Jesus refrain from posting? This was written to the church of 2020. I, I think there would be workplace examples we would be forced to ask in that situation, in your office, in your cubicle, in your assembly line, what would Jesus do? And I think there would be an example from your neighborhood, that situation, that conversation, what would Jesus do? And I think in 2020, there would also be an example about how we as the church respond to civil authority. And I think we would be addressed to not look out for our personal gain or what is most convenient to us or what is best for us. But once again, we'd be driven to the point of asking the question, what would Jesus do? This is where I, I offer up to you that we, we need to be reading our Gospels. We, we need to get familiar with who Jesus is. If we're going to ask the question, what would Jesus do? We need to know what Jesus would do. That leads us to my final word for you this morning. We've already discussed that our citizenship is in heaven. We've discussed that as citizens of heaven, we point the world to our heavenly Father. And the last point is simple. I've actually already said it. We point the world to our heavenly Father. 
by walking in the footsteps of Jesus in order to, to live good lives among the pagans, in order to live good lives in front of the world around us, we have to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. We, we need to walk so closely with Jesus that we're covered in the dust from his sandals. And to make this point, Peter reminds us of the footsteps of Jesus. Focus your attention back to verse 21. He says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insets, insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep gone astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Think about that. When Jesus encountered insults and suffering, When Jesus encountered threats, insults, and, and suffering, he did not make threats back. He did not retaliate. Rather, he trusted God who will judge everyone justly and rightly. And to a group who was facing persecution. Peter told them, walk in the steps of Jesus. I know this is difficult, but when, when you trade insult and suffering with insult and retaliation, you walk in the steps of the world not in the steps of Jesus. And I know when we hear that, our, our first reaction is strong. Our, our first reaction is emotional. And you hear me as a preacher with a microphone telling you not to retaliate, not to make threats, and you go, but no, 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 that's just unrealistic. That's not how the world works. And I would respond, exactly how the world works. But you're called to follow Jesus and not the world. We're to live good lives to where people see us and they see good deeds and it leads them to glorify God in heaven. This passage ends in a, in a beautiful picture of, of Jesus fulfilling prophecy. Isaiah 53 speaks of a suffering servant, one who would bear weight. He would bear punishment. He would provide through his stripes healing for God's people. And Peter, in our passage, connects the dots from the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 to Jesus Christ who bore our sins on the cross. And with that, there's a simple exhortation. Jesus bore your sins on the cross, so follow him wherever he leads. If Jesus bore your sins on the cross, so follow him 
However, he leads. This morning, you, you may be facing difficulty. And as humans, as people surrounded by the world, your first instinct in reaction to those situations is to respond in a way that benefits you. This passage teaches us to respond in a way that resembles Jesus and points the world around us to our Heavenly Father. What would Jesus do? It, it sounds cliche. Uh, perhaps it, it sounds too simplistic. But perhaps it's the correct question to ask. Because when we ask it, it leads not to our personal gain, but it leads those around us seeing our good deeds and praising our Father in heaven. Do you join me in a moment of prayer? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your grace and your patience towards us. Father, we confess that we get it wrong time and time again. We respond like the world time and time again. And it's our prayer this morning that you would open our eyes and our hearts to the way of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May the people of First Baptist Sulphur Springs live like Jesus. May, may we walk in his footsteps and may it result in Hopkins County praising you. May the good deeds of First Baptist Sulphur Springs lead to a revival where this county bows everything at your feet. Give us strength. Give us wisdom. May we be the church that you've called us to be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.